saying to you before I started the recording that we are going to be looking at Walter Rodney and the struggle for democracy in Guyana. Walter Rodney and the struggle for democracy in Guyana. And I was making the point that I have never discussed Walter Rodney in any Caribbean thought class I have taught at JTS and I have not seen him on any syllabus, okay? And I say to you, we, this is the penultimate class, the second to last class. And so we have, before we finish anything, we have to get into Walter Rodney. And this is part of a longer presentation, a very long 18 to 25 presentation, but I'm gonna present a summarized version of it. And then after that, as I present the summary of it, I will ask you some questions. I will ask you some questions. And the question, in, one of the questions is, Walter Rodney raises several important questions concerning the struggle for liberation in Guyana. And one of the questions, as, as, we, as we delve into his essay, one of the questions that you want to ask, is, he, he asks that you want to think about is how can the working class challenge the Burham dictatorship and assert its power? Now, who is Burham? We'll talk about, we'll find out who Burham, Burham was a political figure. Okay, a political figure, but a, a kind of a dictator, a dictator in, in, in um, but not necessarily of a socialist dictator, but was a capitalist dictator in a sense, working on behalf of the political regime, the Washington consensus, work, just as how Ma Maurice Bishop was working with, was the leader of the People's Revolutionary Army, and with, they were fighting for change. He met his, his demise, just as how Walter Rodney met his dis demise. Just as how um, we talk about people who are fighting within these countries for change. It's not easy because they are working against very powerful people, working against the status quo. And there are people, we call them host slaves, people within your own countries, people within your own populace, fighting against the initiative of the total populace. There are people who they set up, they butter, butter some bread and butter and give to certain people. People who they can, what's going on in Haiti with Ariel, Henri, who is being propped up because the people outside know that if he holds power, then they will continue to dominate the populace. And okay, they'll be able to penetrate. You talk about a picture, an image of Mark, Michael Manley and Fidel Castro. And as against that, you find a picture of who? Edward Siaga cutting ribbons with R Ronald Reagan. You, we we show, um, if you watch some of the videos, we show a picture of that. And there is always this tension, tension between the West and the East, the North and the South. But even within, within poles, within our, within the countries of the global south within the caribbean there is always a there is always this dividedness there is always this group a strategy of propping up a group of working with a group okay in okay in order for them to 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 be the bastion of the status quo within those polarities within those groups within those locals to prevent the change from happening but we'll get to that. What am I talking about, Mr. McKenzie? What, what are you getting at? You know what I'm getting at, but we'll even, we will clarify it in a more coherent form. This is an introduction. But how can the working class challenge the Burham dictatorship and assert its power? The second, the second question that you will have to ask yourself is what is the significance of civil disobedience and non-cooperation in the struggle for liberation? And we talk about civil disobedience and cooperation earlier. Civil disobedience. How do you reconcile our Christian heritage, our Judeo-Christian culture, or our drive to, to our, 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 our Christian inherit and legacies, our, and this, this, this drive, this obedience, to be obedient, obedient men and women and girls and boys, that, and that is why many Rastafarians and many liberation 
liberation activists and nationalists did not embrace Christianity and the Judeo-Christian faith. And so because they're telling they're saying that we adopt a kind of Christianity and faith that make us from the from a Eurocentric faith that made us simpletons, simpletons that made us complicit in the injustice of colonization, the injustice that, that was meted out to us. Because how do you reconcile this civil this, this civil this need to be disobedient or to, to, to demonstrate civil disobedience and this non-cooperation in the struggle for liberation and this drive for wanting to please the status quo with our Jesus meek and mild, with our, with our Christianity that promotes a kind of religiosity that says we must be obedient in order to be blessed. Blessing on, on, on those who are obedient. Obey our masters. Obey our, a, a religion that promotes slavery or that people will justify slavery. When, when we look at the kind of slavery that the Bible talks about, that's a far stretch of slavery. But yet still, how do you reconcile this, 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 this struggle for liberation with, with the civil disobedience and this non-cooperation with our Christianity? And then we talk about, in a, in a Caribbean theology, a Caribbean thought class, we talk about this, the Rast we're going to talk about this later on in, 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 in class today, this, the Rastas. And one of the reasons why Rast Rastafarianism was a religion of, was not just a religion, but we, it was also a political system. Um, Bob Marley says, I don't promote, I, I, I am not, I don't, I, I, I am not Rast, I am not capitalist or Marxist, I am Rasta. In other words, the way for him, the way out for him is one that is religious, but that religious, that religious method of or religious way out was also political. A religion that promotes political freedom. But anyways, the question, the next is how can how can national unity be achieved in Guyana? given its diverse racial and class diversions. How can national unity be achieved in Guyana or Jamaica or Haiti, given its diverse racial and class divisions? Yeah, this is important. In Trinidad, we talk about, that was important, the, div the dividedness. We talk about division. Nationalism promoted a kind of independence of the nation, devoid of a solid, a Caribbean solidarity that was needed Okay, as new nations in order to counteract what was coming in the 1970s, in order to counteract the United Nations and the, and the strategy they have to turn and to translate, to, to transform these countries, these former colonies who are now in, moving towards independence as dependent capitalist nations, okay, to counteract structural adjustment and debt. The way in which the new nation was formulated, it was formulated with a kind of religion that, okay, that is that eschewed civil disobedience and non-cooperation. A kind of culture and religion, yes, that, or thought, that eschews national unity in a sense. Because based on class division, based on race, based on color, based on our English taste. The more English you are, the more you're able to speak the British, the Queen's language, and the more educated you are, that also determines the race and, your race, and your race also helps to mitigate any resistance to needed change. So we talk, when we talk about who is responsible for the Caribbean, yes, there was a strategy but I said to you, we, when you watch life and death, the issue of weak need and lacking in vision, weak need and lacking in vision and strategy. Unity, unity and solidarity is, okay, is important for change. So you, so you want to structure a Caribbean that is, that is, that is that that is not united, that is divided based on the very same thing that 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 these countries have: the race and the class. 
which help and which helps to mitigate because divided we fall, united we stand. One of the questions you will ask yourself is, what is the alternative to Burham dictatorship? And how can the people reclaim their rights and restore democracy? Because you have some people, Burham was, Burham pretended, just as Ariel, Ariel, um, the, the, the former president, the, I'm sorry, the current dictator of, of, of Haiti, is pretending to be, is pretending to, to lead, is to, to, be a, 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 to, to be for democracy. It's pretending to be about unity and, 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 and so on and so forth, but he's not. That's the same thing what is happening with the Burham government in Guyana, a pretend, a, a, a kind of leadership group that they have pretending to be uh, representing the people and for the people, pretending a, a leadership and a politics of populism and governance and democracy. But in effect, it is not. It is di dictatorship. And I said to you, same thing, if countries like, like uh, Cuba and Fidel Castro, he had a good message, but then it, it is, the message became corrupted with, with message of totalitarianism. And, and, and with the people who are trying to hold on to power. How can, the, how can resistance be sustained against the violence and intimidation of the dictatorship? So he, we will answer those questions as we delve into today's lecture. So today's lecture looks at Walter Rodney and the struggle for democracy. Now, um, when we talk about um, Walter Rodney, who is Walter Rodney? Walter Rodney is a renowned historian and socialist from Guyana. He was a renowned historian and socialist from Guyana. He was not only known for his academic work, but also as a political leader. As a political leader, he was an active member of the Working People's Alliance. The working, notice, notice some of the political parties, the People Revolutionary Party, the People's the National, the People Revolutionary Party that was Maurice Bishop and in, in Grenada. And notice in Jamaica, Michael Manley, you have the People's National, the People's National Party. And here in Guyana, he was a member of the Working People's Alliance, the WPA, and a critic of the authoritarian Forbes, the authoritarian Forbes Burham dictatorship. Now, Burham thought, Burham, Burham, what? Though the Burham, though claiming to be socialist, Burham was what Burham was one of the was a dictator, and he claimed to be socialist. And please remember that we talk about socialism, like Michael Manley was a socialist, Fidel Castro was a socialist, George Padmore believed in a socialist kind of um, nationalism. Burham claimed to be a socialist, but he was not. But he was using the argument for socialism. Burham, though claiming to be socialist, maintained a repressive regime in Guyana and had friendly ties with the United States. Just, just same thing with um, Michael Manley. Sorry, not Michael Manley, um, Edward Siaga. Maintained a repressive regime in Guyana. So what he maintained a repressive regime in, 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 in Guyana and had friendly ties with the United States. But he held, but look at what is going on in Haiti today. The same thing is happening. A core group of people, you install a leadership power, the, the former powers or the, or the, the post-industrial countries, you, 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 you install your own leader, you install your own person, yes? Who is, and then that very same person who is, yes, who is, who resembles the people, who looks like you, who looks Caribbean, 
and who takes on a form of Christianity or a form of political system that is for the people, but yet still maintaining a repressive regime. That is not new. That is not new. It also happened in Guyana. And it almost happened in Grenada and in Jamaica. If you look at okay, what was happening in, in the 90s. Burham held through rigged elections and suppression of opposition parties and trade unions. Walter Rodney was an important political figure in his native country. And he wrote an essay called Walter Rodney and the Struggle for Democracy in Guyana. And what he did was that he sets out a biting critique of the Burham, of the Forbes Burnham dictatorship that went on to murder him in 1980. In 1980. He was murdered in 1980. He was murdered 40 years ago at the age of 38. 38 years old. And he was probably best remembered for his classic 1972 work, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa and Other Writings. But he was also a political activist and one of the leaders of the Working People's Alliance Party in his native country that put him at odds with the demagogic authoritarian regime of Forbes Burham. Although Burham claimed to be socialist, Burham dictatorship maintained good relations with the US, which supplied aid, look what's going on in Haiti, and training for its security machine. As historian Manning Marable observed that the Carter, the Carter administration, the Carter the Carter administration, Jim, Jimmy Carter from the US, the Carter administration viewed Guyana in the same political league as Somalia and communist China. They saw Guyana and in some extent Jamaica and, 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 and Haiti and, and Cuba, they saw them, they saw them in the same political league or aspiring towards that. Somalia and communist China as nominal socialist regime, which outlawed democratic rights at home and was willing to become a junior partner with US imperialism. So Burham held power through repression and rigged elections, clamping down on parties and trade unions that opposed his rule while allowing bizarre cult leaders like the Reverend Jim Jones to set up shop on Guyanese soil. Burham, yes, allowed the Reverend Jim Jones, if you know about the, the sect, the, 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 the religious sect. When asked about his personal safety, Walter Rodney insisted that he could not afford to go into exile. There's only one way to bring about basic changes in Guyana or any third world country. And that's by working with the people in the country. I have to run the same risks as everyone else. And so on June 13th, 1980, a booby trap bomb killed Rodney. Remember we talk about, uh, 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 um, what's his name again? Jean Bertrand Aristide, how he was abducted and kidnapped and he would have been assassinated. When you fight against the status quo, this is the backlash you get. When you try, when you, and, and I'm telling you, this is what you get. And in the 21st century, somebody like us, like me, like all of us who's doing this kind of critical history, they will fight against you. If they don't fight, they fight against you in many different ways. They go on your IP address, they block you. They, on your, on Comcast and they work together through legal or illegal, or they have you sign shoe deals to keep you in line. And when you break the rule, they take away the shoe deal from you so that you fall in line. They have different ways of controlling you. 
with um yes different ways but on june 13th i was born on june 14th 1979 but this was on june 13 1980 a year a, a couple months a year before i was born oh sorry one year after i was born one day before my one year birthday he was killed a booby trap bomb was bomb killed rodney the leading figure of Caribbean socialism. Jamaica's Michael Manley, Grenada's Maurice Bishop, and Cuba's Fidel Castro all denounced his murder. For Manley, it was a wanton and brutal action and an assault against humanity. In, this, in the essay composed shortly before his death, he wrote this essay just before his death, Rodney analyzed the nature of the Burham dictatorship denouncing its corruption and incompetence and setting out a political strategy for its overthrow. As Trevor A. Campbell noted, the style of, represent, the style of presentation bears the stamp of lucidity and unambiguity, which was characteristic of all of Rodney's writings or written and spoken words, whether writing for an academic journal or delivering a speech at a mass political meeting. Forbes Burham died in 1985, five years or so after he killed Walter Rodney. An official report published in 2014 concluded that Burham knew of the plan and was part of the conspiracy to assassinate Dr. Walter Rodney. Men in the past have boasted of being dictators this is how um, Walter Rodney started his essay. Men in the past have boasted of being dictators. Some have, been, have even pretended to be benevolent autocrats, ruling in the interests of those over whom they exercise absolute power and control. Recently, Samosa of Nicaragua went down fighting as an unrepentant dictator we talk about Franz Fanon. The CIA met him at the airport when he came to, to Washington, D.C. They were suspicious of him because he was part of the, he was part of the revolutionary movement, the, the fighting in the, Al, what was it, the, the Algerian War for Liberation or Libya. And he was part of all of that. Recently, Samosa of Nicaragua went down fighting as an unrepentant dictator. But nowadays, hardly any rules admit that they are dictators. The demand for freedom has become universal and repression feels the need for camouflaging itself. Thus, the Pinochet regime in Chile rigged a referendum to tell the world that the Chilean people voted for a dictatorship. Idi Amin claimed to have had the support of the Ugandan masses from, the, from he, uh, whom he was butchering the world has come to shun racist regimes, military dictatorships, and all dictatorial governments. This climate of international opinion offers the first ex explanation as to why the Forbes Burham dictatorship refers to remain, remain disguised, disguised. The issue of disguise. The Burham dictatorship present itself as its own opposite. That is to say, it presents itself as a democracy. The Ariel Henry government in, 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 in Haiti. Ariel Henry. The Ariel Henry Burham dictate, Burham dict, uh, the Ariel dictatorship resembles that of the Burham dictatorship in Guyana. Presenting themselves as their own opposite. What am I saying? Ariel Henry, just like the um, just, uh, just like Burham government in Guyana, presents itself as a democracy. This pattern has been determined by the manner in which Burham achieved political power. Some dictators seize power by violence and frequently happened in Latin America. Some inherit from a previous strong man as the case of Babi Doc Duvalier, who succeeded Papa Doc Duvalier of Haiti. 
Occasionally, a dictator can arrive on the scene as part of an electoral process like Ariel Henry. A dictator can arrive on the scene as part of an electoral process before taking the step of brazenly undermining the self, the, the, the self same electoral system like what is going on in Haiti today undermining the electoral system and being popped up and supported by an international regime that allows for penetration or easy penetration. This was the case with Adolf Hitler, who subverted German, German bourgeois democracy in the 1930s. Burham has taken a similar road to power, subverting the democratic system of which he was part in 1953 subverting the democratic system of which he was a part in 1953. This is important. We cannot say that Guyana today has reached the same stage as Germany under Hitler's rule, because that would be too loose a sense of proportion. Burham as a dictator is petty because ours is a nation of less than a million people, less than a million people living in Guyana at the time. Hitler had a mad wish to rule the world. For this reason, he is generally described as a megalomaniac, a megalomaniac. Hitler's mega, mega, um, um, megalomania was backed by the powerful German economy and the might of the German army. Burham's Mega megalomania is closer to, to comedy and farce. It takes the form of wearing a general's uniform and hoping that the army will conquer his own people. In the long run, however, every dictator is like any other dictator. Every dictator is like any other dictator. Burham from Guyana certainly has the capacity to make life miserable for the entire population of our small nation. The same thing can be said of Ariel Henry of Haiti. He certainly has the capacity to make life miserable for the entire population of Haiti. I'm, not, I'm gonna stop there, I'm gonna send you the article and you will have and you can read it from it's up 25 pages but some people i realize some of you do not like once you leave the class you guys don't get into these things but when you start to get into these things when you understand life is about people and how and what people make of it yes when you understand that and then you start to put into perspective the kind of life that you have and the kind of life that we live in the caribbean and the lack and the dependency and so on and so forth and you look at the strategy of all things, then you will start to think, want to read, you want to get delve into these issues. And then it will help you to think about, okay, how will you reinvent your own life? How will the Caribbean reinvent its own, reinvent itself? And who will lead this reinvention? And it means that we have to revisit history. And you see what is going on now, it is still happening today. So Burham claiming to be socialist was maintaining a repressive regime in Guyana and had friendly ties with the United States, Jimmy Carter, who rubber stamped his, his, his president. Because you know why? I, I guess maybe, you know, I thought Jimmy Carter was a nice and um, diminutive man, unassuming. Bill, Clark, Bill Clinton was a nice man. Ronald Reagan was a nice man. But when you start to put it in the context of Colin, political, the social political economy of Caribbean and the global competitiveness that, and, and how we and how Caribbean has suffered over the years, how black people and people of color suffer over there, how people of a particular pedigree in your classes suffer over the years and the, and the policies that these people, then you start to, to think twice about people like Bill Clinton who, 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 who orchestrated NAFTA, yes? People like Jimmy Carter, who supported Burham, who killed um, Walter Rodney, and so on and so forth. You start to put it into perspective. He held power, Burham, 
through rigged elections and suppression of opposition parties and trade unions. If you look at Haiti now, half the where, where, where is the opposition? Fine, let us have a political system. We have a political system with, with, with different parties. Where are they? Many of them are locked up. Many of them are in, in jail. Being held for something that, okay, being held for the killing of the former prime minister, which can I tell you, which is, a, which is a, a, an argument conve for convene to kill any competition. He held power through rigged elections and a suppression of opposition parties and trade unions. Rodney, aware of the tricks, chose to work with Guyana, chose to work within Guyana. He could have worked outside of Guyana. He chose to work within Guyana to bring about change. He was assassinated by his own people, working with the international regime. That is why they can, because there are some people on the ground who are benefiting. We talk about maybe, maybe, and I said in neoliberalism, my book, Neoliberalism, Globalization, Income Inequality, maybe they made deals. The nouveau rich, they made deals with others. The people in the house slave mentality, the house slave mentality, murdered, whipped, and killed. He was assassinated during international condemnation from figures like Michael Manley, Maurice Bishop, Fidel Castro. In his essay written before his death, Rodney analyzed the nature of the Burham dictatorship, exposing its corruption, incompetence, and tactics for consolidating power. He criticized the regime's personality cult and its attempt to appear as a democracy while suppressing fundamental rights. In other words, pseudo appeal to authority. Pseudo appeal to something. Again, let me read it again. He criticized the regime, personality cult. And it's, with, that's why in my, new book, I, in, that, in my new book, I talk about pseudo communism. Pseudo, what, that's what I'm getting at when I talk about pseudo communism. And neo-capitalism. A false, a false notion. Communism is not about dictatorial um, totalitarianism. Communism is not about siding with the Washington consensus and holding down power for yourself and mistreating your people. That has nothing to do with communism. That's pseudo-communism. Neo-capitalism is not about nepotism. Cap sorry, capitalism, capitalism is about fear competition. And none of these countries that promoted capitalism was about capitalism. They were about pharisaicalism, nepotism, and bureaucracy. Presenting, we talk about the plot. That's what, that is what my second book is about. Neo, in, in, in neoliberal globalization, we consider neo-capitalism and the death of nation. A false appearance, pharisaicalism. We know what that is because Jesus said that the Jews were too far to see and too sad to see. Do as I say, but not as I do. He criticized the regime's personality cult and its attempt to appear as a democracy while suppressing fundamental rights. That, that is still happening today. That is still happening today. And I say to you, Caribbean people, we have to be mindful of that. Rodney highlighted how the dictatorship established its control, eroding press freedom. How did it establish control? Eroding press freedom, the freedom of the press. I mean, you're... Jimmy Carter is about humanitarianism, yes? Jimmy Carter and the US. We are up there about promoting democracy, a kind of international law. But, but the, South African, the South African foreign minister some time ago say, to, made a comparison between how the US and um, how the international community is quick to apply international law when it suits them and how they are quick to withhold it when it does not suit them. Here it is that Jimmy Carter and the U.S. was promoting Burham leadership and Burham governance. 
But what was he doing? At the same time, Burham was on the ground eroding the freedom of the press. But yet still, that, was, that is what democracy is about and freedoms and so on. But yet still, they were doing just that, eroding the freedom of the press. That's what's going on in Haiti. The international community is propping up a government in Haiti. But, okay? That is eroding freedoms and taking away certain international rights and democracy. But yet still, they are for democracy. Such duplicity, such duplicity and hypocrisy. Manipul and and they so, so Rodney highlights how the, the, the how the dictatorship slowly established its control. One, eroding press freedom. Two, manipulating the army and police and using um, cunning tactics to solidify its power. Again, manipulating the army and police. And three, using cunning tactics to solidify power. He called on the people to reject the false image. Who is calling on? Walter Rodney called on the people to reject the false image of Burham as a great leader and to stand against the dictatorship. The struggle for democracy in Guyana has a long history. Rooted in the fight for freedom by various classes, including slaves and indentured laborers, and Rodney emphasized the need for action and unity among the people to expose and challenge the illegitimate government, the illegitimate government. Through public gatherings and press restrictions, the dictatorship's true nature became evident. The people must continue to resist and demand genuine democracy in their country. The people must continue to resist and demand genuine democracy in their country. The people in Haiti must continue to do that. The people in the global South must continue to do that. And the other day, recently, we saw how the Caribbean community stood up to post-colonial, post-industrial countries. That is what it requires. Working, okay, let's look at the next. Let's, then he talks about working class power and unity. This is all talking about, okay, fine. What, how do we, how can the people continue to resist, to resist and demand genuine? Which, this is talking about working class power and unity. The path to overthrowing the dictatorship. The next excerpt that we shall read summarizes the, the significance of working class power and unity in challenging not just Burham, but dictatorship overall and achieving national liberation in Guyana. The history of successful strikes and collective labor actions has demonstrated the potential of organized workers to undermine the regime's control and stand up for their rights. The need to overcome fear and embrace the notion of strikes being political is emphasized. The need to overcome fear. I was taught, I had one member of my class was talking about Haiti and he was so nervous that I, I went as far as to read it. I had to edit the class and block out his face because he was afraid. The issue of fear, sometimes people are afraid the need to overcome fear and embrace the notion of strikes being political is emphasized. We have to overcome fear. We have to be overcome fear and be bold as it is the collective power of the people that can challenge the oppressive dictatorship, the collective power. But what mitigates collective power? Political parties who can't get beyond themselves and the personality cult.
That is why I said to the prime minister, we need to, the kind of politics that we need is not the kind of politics that we have inherited that is set against us, stacked against us, a political party, tribal politics of PNP and JLP. And okay, no, PNP can't do nothing good and JLP can't be anything good. That's not the politics. That's the kind of politics that we inherited that served us well to keep us down. The other day, a group of politicians removed a JLP councillor, a PNP councillor, but it took the effort of both the PNP and the JLP. When you are a new nation coming out of the coming out of colonization, okay, you are at the the early stages of development. You don't, we don't need a kind of political system that divides us and holds us back. That is the exact political part um, system that we adopted. I say to you, I say to you, I'm not PNP or JLP. But if I like what and, and um, Han, Han, Andrew, because I am, you know, I'm a post-colonial subject. I'm against dividedness. I will not be lumped up into a group. Because, you know, when you start, when you practice political franchisement, then it affects your ability to hold people accountable. How can you hold people accountable when you are, when you are driven by political franchisement and tribalism? That is exactly what Ro Walter Rodney was getting at and talking about. The history of successful strikes and collective labor actions. Sorry, where am I? He called for the people to reject the false image of Burnham as a, as a great leader and to stand against the dictatorship. The struggle for democracy in Guyana has a long history, rooted in the fight for freedom by various classes, slaves and indentured laborers. Do you notice? Slaves, the, those from Africa, and those who came from and those who were brought on after independence, sorry, after emancipation, where the okay, the same thing happened in Trinidad. There was this fight between the slaves and, and those who came as indentured laborers later on, and there was this fight that has served to hold us back as well. And then you find out what's going on in Jamaica today. We talk about okay, and it's not just in Jamaica, look in African American communities who own the shops and the stores. Black people can't own anything, any shops. It okay. You have to be of you have to be Latino or you have to be Chinese. Okay. Black people can't hold nothing in, 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 in these in their own communities, in their own countries. You go in Philadelphia, you go to the corner shops. How many black shops you have? How many black shops you have? And I said to you, when you look at the black position, the black position is the same thing. You go in the Caribbean, it's the same. You come in in African American, you come in the US and you go into the African community, African American communities or communities predominantly occupied by people of the of the diaspora or people who or, or, or African or whatever. It's the same thing. They can only have a barber shop. They can only look to sports. And then they and then they hold them down by tying them to some shoe deal. Rodney emphasized the need for action and unity among the people to expose and challenge the illegitimate government. Through public gatherings and press restrictions. And by the way, guys, you can share this stuff, share the articles, share the videos that we are doing, share every, I don't care. I'm not about to, I'm, I, I'm not just about, I mean, of course I want to make, I want to, I want to grow my, my, my wealth so I can use it to empower people. And I said to, to, to people, of course, share, share your people's stuff. Share our, our books, read our books. 
support the business. Buy Jamaican products. Rodney emphasized it. I'm going to actually, there are several articles I have to publish. I'll turn this into an article and I'll send it, send it as well. You guys, I mean, you know, this is important. This is a passionate class. This is very important. This particular subject matter and issue is important to me. It is important to me. This is my resistance. The, I, I read to you last week that the colonial subject must be, must, he must be constantly of his image. Franz Fanon talks about that. Constantly a fear away of his image. Rodney emphasized the need for action and unity, action and unity among the people to expose and challenge the illegitimate government. The same thing that is needed in, in, in Haiti. But guess what? They are so divided in terms of political. What they need is for the whole, everybody to come together in Haiti. But you know what? They are fighting over scarce benefits and spoils. Uh, uh, Motty Perkins used to talk, talk about that. Scarce benefits and spoils. Through political gathering, through public gatherings and press restrictions, the dictatorship, Burham dictatorship's true nature became evident. The people must continue to resist and demand genuine democracy in their country. Working class power and unity, the path of, to overthrowing the dictatorship. What is ho, ho, working class unity? The, okay, we actually started that. I said that the history of successful strikes and collective labor unions has demonstrated the potential of organized workers to undermine the regime's control and stand up for their rights. Again, the sick, in, in order to in order for work, the working class, the working class, in order for the working class to, to overthrow dictatorship and to, ex and to rescue themselves from dependency and lack, the significance of the working class and their power and the unity becomes very important. The history of successful strikes and collective labor actions has demonstrated the potential of organized workers to undermine the regime's control and stand up for their rights. The need to overcome fear and embrace the notion of strikes being political, political is emphasized as it is the collective power of the people that can change the oppressive dictatorship, the collective power of the people, the collective power of the people. It is the collective power of the people that can change and challenge the oppressive dictatorship. The recent bauxite strike, the recent bauxite strike stands as a testament to the strength of the Guyanese working class, attracting support from various sectors and inspiring workers or other workers to pursue their just demands. By the way, let me just check. Am, am I recording, guys? Am I recording? Yes, sir. Good, good. However, however, moving from the recent box site strike, as 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 outlaid by this Mr. Dr. Walter Rodney. However, the dictatorship responds. The dictatorship responds with victimization and attempt to eliminate the strike to strike and work. The dismissal of strikes of strikers becomes the rallying point for workers to stand together in the unified labor unions and labor actions, exposing the regime's vulnerabilities and challenging its authority. Part of, part of the plan was to, you know, to de-unionize these countries, like part of globalization, was to de-unionize, liberalize, but you to liberalize, you have to do some stuff. You have to de-unionize. Get rid of unions in some of these countries, in Jamaica, Barbados, Trinidad, all these. Get rid of unions. And there was always this policy to, to de-unionize, to get rid of unions, which is absolutely ridiculous. Unions is absolutely vital to the populace. 
It's not just voting in an election because it's some elections that are rigged based on money, how much people have the most money. Elect elected government must not think that the only way that the people and the populace make a decision about their governance is through elections, which happen once every five or so years. Also through collective power and through, through organizing. If a particular, if the, govern if the government of the day think that they are, if, if, they are, uh, if they are acting outside of what the people are expecting them to organize, it should not take us four more years of their, of their lunacy and, sorry, lunacy and their dictatorship for us to wait to, for change. We must properly wait for them to mistreat and to disregard people to systems that is geared to do just that, to continue to keep them in power. No, that is why we have unions and strikes, which throughout history, people have tried to, to, to we talk about union um, uh, dormancy, union dormancy, trying to make unions dormant, which is one, one, one method that people have, strategy that the people have to mitigate against totalitarianism and, dicta and dictatorship. The dismissal of strikers become the rallying point for workers to stand together in unified labor unions, exposing the regime, the regime's vulnerabilities and challenging its authority. The strategy of civil disobedience, the strategy of civil disobedience, and by the way, I can share this document with you. Uh, when we take a break, I will share it. The strategy of civil disobedience and non-cooperation is also discussed as a means of resisting oppression, drawing inspiration from historical figures like Mahatma Gandhi and the civil rights movement in the USA. The text emphasizes the importance of collective action and the readiness to disobey unjust laws or an unjust state in pursuit of justice and liberation. This is powerful. Somebody just left the class. I, wonder, I don't want nobody to leave this class today. This is a powerful class. And I'm passionate about this class. Again, because this, this particular incident is very important. The strategy of civil disobedience and non-cooperation, if anybody is going to leave the class, I need to know that you will be leaving the class. Now, the strategy of civil disobedience and non-cooperation is also discussed as a means of as a resisting oppression, drawing inspiration from historical figures like Mahatma Gandhi and the civil rights movement in the US, emphasizing the importance of collective action and the readiness to what? To disobey, to disobey unjust laws or an unjust state in pursuit of justice and liberation. So the question is, when is it right to disobey? When are laws unjust and when they promote injustices. Let that sink in. Let that sink in. Again, Walter Rodney speaks to the, his, his essay, talks about the importance of what? Collective action, collective action and the readiness to disobey unjust laws. But you know what? What prevents that readiness? What mitigates that readiness to, to disobey unjust law? You know, Edward said, what did I say about PJ Patterson? He said, the law is not a shackle, but only for some. It's not a shackle for some, but not for others, not for the populace, not for those who are in Guyana and Jamaica and so on and so forth, not for the people of the global south, not for the black and brown people, the people of color, not for those people. Only some can disobey the law. Only some can get away with use, finding loopholes in the tax laws. Only some don't have to pay taxes and so on. Only some in order that they maintain their privilege and their dominance and have competitive advantages. And I say to you, and that is why this class is important. 
important. The readiness to disobey. We have to be ready to disobey some laws. One, one time, one, one, um, one of the Blairs said they don't pay taxes. He deliberately don't pay taxes because he believed the taxes are unjust and illegal and unlawful. Now, that is a debate for something else. For, you know, because I believe that it's important for us as a country to pay tax, to, to come together collectively to determine, but then it cannot be unjust. We have to make that. We have to see. That's why I say to you, you can't leave your, everything up to your government. Don't follow what, um, uh, what Plato, Plato talked about, the Republic. They, they talked about in Plato's Republic, he talked about a society that is ordered in a certain way with the guardians and the philosopher kings and so on and so forth. And you have the philosopher kings at the top and at the bottom, you have the simpletons who don't know anything, okay, who allow the people at the top to, to protect the society through, their, through, through wars or military machinery or through people who develop policies and what those at the bottom do. They just do whatever, whatever they do because they don't have, because, or oh, they are not driven by certain intellectualism or certain, you know, the, absolutely ridiculous. Don't be too apolitical and indifferent to the social political economy of your country and the decision that your people are making. Ask the question that they're not asking. Listen to what they're not being said. Read things widely. Say, for example, that we talked about the five to 500, the new Jamaican dollar bills and so on and so forth. The development of racial unity is seen as a significant achievement in the face of the dictatorship's attempt to divide and conquer. The call for broad unity, the call for broad unity across existing class lines, including the, the involvement, again, the call for broad unity across existing class lines, upper class, middle class, or lower class, white, black, Indian, educated or not too educated. The call for broad unity across existing lines, including the involvement of the middle class, is crucial for a successful movement against the regime. The notion of a government of national unity, representing all sectors and social strata, is represented as a powerful alternative to the oppressive regime and the force for the future of Guyana. Ultimately, the message is clear. The power of the people united is the ultimate weapon against the Burham dictatorship through collective action, civil disobedience and national unity. The working class can overcome fear, challenge oppression and strive for a more just and democratic society in Guyana. In the essay, Walter Rodney raises several important questions concerning the struggle for liberation in Guyana. And we want to explore some of these questions and how he answers them. We will take a quick break and then we will come back. We'll be right back after this. Give a, we will take a break for five minutes and then we will ask the question, how can the working class challenge the Burham dictatorship and assert power? What is the significance of civil disobedience? and non-cooperation in struggle for liberation. How can national unity be achieved in Guyana given its diverse racial and class division? What is the, the alternative to the Burham dictatorship and how can the people reclaim their rights and re restore democracy? How can resistance be sustained against the violence and intimidation of, of the dictatorship? And then we will, and we will end right there. And then for, oh, and the question, what can, uh, how um how instructive what can we learn from from this from um Walter Rodney's article as it relates to the Caribbean being a reinvention and how we are to reinvent it in the twenty first century again what are we to learn from um from Walter Rodney's essay And the Caribbean's reinvent and the Caribbean's invention and how we are to be reinvented. We'll be right back after this. Welcome back. Now, 
ultimately the message is the message in um, Ro, um, Walter Rodney's essay is clear. The power of the people united is ultimate weapon against the Burham dictatorship through collective action, civil disobedience, and national unity. The working class can overcome fear, challenge oppression, and strive for a more just and democratic society in Guyana. Um, of course, Guyana is not, Guyana, I mean, there's a, actually, I wrote an article recently about the discovery of oil in, the, in Guyana and what it means for the Caribbean, <clears throat> what it means for the Caribbean, but Guyana has, has not, has suffered in a sense, they have not realized or benefited significantly from the, from their resources. And they, I mean, Guyana should be one of the wealthiest countries in the world. I'm telling you that, Guyana, in terms of where they are located, the riches, the richness in terms of the resources and tourism. But for, for some reason, the countries in the Caribbean, and when you start to look at Guyana's history, then you understand. Guy, um, Walter, Walter Rodney raised the same thing with Haiti and Trinidad and Venezuela. I mean, the region, the Caribbean region has, is rich in resources, but its people are, we are among the poorest in the world. Walter Rodney raises several important questions concerning the struggle for liberation in Guyana. I want to explore some of these questions and how, and how he, he answers them. The first one is, how can the working class challenge the Burham dictatorship and assert its power? That was one of the questions he asked. And if I were to ask you, what, com what the first thing, without you reading the answer, what would be your answer? How does Burham, how does Walter Rodney, say how the working class can challenge the Burha or dictatorship. How can, they, how can we challenge dictatorship according to, to, um, to, 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 to Rodney? Welcome back, guys. So, firstly, good evening. Good evening, everyone. Good, good evening. evening, sir. I believe um, in order for us to challenge this dictatorship or uh, inaction or, or um, inability to participate or decision to not participate in what this dictatorship dictates is, is a start. You know, there, right. there are a lot of things that Ms. Dr. Rodney um, has taught us. I was, I was hoping to hear you speak a little bit more about his travels to Jamaica, sir, and, you know, how his literature has been banned here um, and the fight for just... So you having this class is very, as you said, powerful because... Tell, tell us about that. Tell us about a little bit about that, the, his travel and the literature being banned and so on. Tell me about that. Well, um, I, I, I don't know all the details. I've, I've read how Europe underdeveloped Africa. Um, right. And I've gotten, this was, this was a couple of years ago. And yeah. I have gotten um, somewhat privy of what his studies were like. And I'm not very clear on why it was done. Um, I mean, we can always, speak about the fact that, you know, his radicalism was very disruptive and as such, banning his literature here, um, starting from the schools, UA, you know, um, the, the tertiary education level of schooling would, would make sense if you find that this is someone who is willing to disrupt the status quo, you know, so having this kind of conversation is, is very interesting to have here, but on a wider scale, this person who was murdered in his own country after returning from Jamaica um, 
has has not only been murdered, but his work has been, you know, um, I want to say snuffed or muzzled because of what I'm not quite sure. Um, but I do know that he was here and he was teaching, he was teaching at, at UA, he's a professor. Um, and yeah. so he was he was teaching the same thing that we're we're learning about right now, you know, but his his approach to disrupting the status quo and his innate radicalism, I believe, is what led to, you know, his literature being no longer disseminated here. Um, we talk about Pinnacle, we talk about all of these things. Walter Rodney was was somewhat the, I want to say, the forerunner of, of this discussion, especially in, in the Rastafari, you know, liberty. He's, he's a, a character that is spoken about a lot. His teachings are, 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 are held to be sacred because of the fact that the government just decides to listen. We don't want to not hear what I must say, you know, which I find to be really interesting. But when you listen to him, I mean, he's making a powerful point. Because of course you can understand, please remember that you have a JLP versus PNP, you know, um, you know, the Jimmy Carter government and the U Jamaican Caribbean countries were getting a lot of help. I mean, US aid and money from the International Monetary Fund. So of course, um, from the Washington consensus. So of course he was not popular, popular figure. He was a socialist. Some people thought he was a socialist, like Michael Manley was a socialist. Okay. And, um, and he, look what's going on in Haiti today. Yes. Look what's going on in Haiti was quite in terms of how the support that they're getting from the overseas and, um, and they killed their president and have this de facto president and, and he's holding on to power and making it easier for the international community to penetrate. It's all, you know, it's quite interesting when you read these things. I'll allow you to, I'm going to, I'm going to give you, I'm okay. I have some questions. I'm going to break you guys out in the room in five groups. I have groups. We have question one, two, three, four, open all rooms. Um, so I have, I have five rooms. Okay. And I want you guys to join based on your group, whatever group you're in, but join based on whatever group you're in. Okay. And I want you to take on one of these questions. In fact, let me, um, Um, let me, uh, let me exit this mode here. Let me share it. Let me send this to you guys. Control copy. I'm going to broadcast. Broadcast. Broadcast voice. I'm not understanding. So I, I, what I, what I'm doing, I'm splitting you guys up in various groups, and then you guys, I'm giving you five to ten minutes, fifteen minutes until nine o'clock to discuss the the question that I'm asking. Um, what I will do is, um, but the Caribbean theology is very important to um, Caribbean thought. So what we will do is, um, we will end this class by discussing the assignment that I have 
introducing the issue of Caribbean theology, because we didn't really get into Caribbean theology, we referred to it, we talked about this in passing. So we'll, I'll end by talk by delving into some important aspects of Caribbean theology that this course deals with and looking at the project that we have working on in lieu of the of a final 25 page group work paper that you guys are supposed to be doing but we will not do instead totally will for the life and death is an interaction paper that everybody's supposed to do and the life and death is an interact i have said that the interaction paper for life and death you have three pieces. You have you have two interaction papers that is individual, the heritage and the one in Haiti, uh, the one with, uh, the, and then the, and the second, the third interaction paper was a group interaction paper, which is supposed to be an interaction or review of the film Life and Death. That's the third interaction paper. But the interaction paper is to be done as a group work because I want to see how you guys work in groups. And then the final piece piece of work was a. Uh, essay, which is supposed to be a 25 page paper, which is usually done as an individual. But what I did to cut down the work, I said, you guys are going to do that in groups. Instead of doing an inter uh, an essay paper of 25 pages, you still do or whatever, do a 25 page essay as a final group work, as a fi of the final group, but you're doing it in your group. But then some persons were saying that they were having some, um, they were saying that it's a lot of work and so on. So I said, what you could do is that the interaction paper that you are going to do for the film, you could work that into your group paper that, and it will cut out half the work. So say, for example, you're gonna do an interaction paper looking at the film or some of the, some of the issues or questions or key, key points raised in the film Life and Death. Then, so, and then, so therefore, if that's the case, then you could use that as a chapter or a section in the group work. And if you submit me, if you submitted a three or five page group work paper, then you will only need to submit another, you only need to give me 20 more, 20 more pages to make it 25. Instead of doing a whole 25, you just, in a sense, you would have already started working on it from doing the review of the film. And then you find, and you will work it into a larger group paper. But what I did was to, I said, okay, we won't do that. We won't do, you will still give me the interaction group work paper with during the film because you still have to do a group work. I, we, I have to see a piece, I have to mark you, I have to see you guys individually, but I have to see you guys in your group. And then the essay, we will not do the essay. I'm giving you a break. All we would need to do is that together as a class, we'll work on a project together, which involves um and a questionnaire that we are leading we're going to and we're going to be i will complete the questionnaire give it to you guys and you give it and you complete it yourselves as well because i think the questionnaire is quite introspective it is it, it's very reflective and it is introspective because it is it want in a sense it is it is a method of coming it's tr it's it is a method of understanding attitudes and how attitudes are changing in the Caribbean from not just hearsay, but from a study that you guys can get involved in. First, you can understand how the paper also gives you the questionnaire is for you to do as well, because it's very reflective, but you also, but we also want to, we want to see what other people in our society is, say, other people within the Jamaican society, how, how their attitudes are changing. So you're going to come give it to them and that's it. And you give it back to me. So that is what we're going to be. You're not, you don't have to give me an essay paper anymore of 25 pages. As long as you have done the five, three to five page interaction paper, there is no other group work that is needed. Okay. From you guys. Um, the only other piece of the only thing left for you guys to do is the exam. And of course, in lieu of the, in lieu of the final work, fi final group work paper, I'm asking you guys to we as a class, we will do this study. You will, we will, complete the questionnaire and also give it to five people within your communities or wherever randomly. And then I will analyze it and share the findings with you guys. That's part of, and that will be the class work. Um, that is what I was saying earlier. Um, so I hope you guys understand that clearly. But before we, um, let me just quickly see, wrap up this particular section by what it is that you guys came up with. Um, 
what is it that you guys came up with in terms of the questions? Let's look at that and then we will end, go back to the, go back to Caribbean theology. How can the working class challenge the Burham dictatorship and assert its power? Anybody, any group wants to want to comment on that? How can the working class challenge dictatorship and assert power? What, um, what would, what, how does, how do you think based on our presentation, how does, how does Rodney, or how would Rodney do that? How would he, how does he, how does he, what, how, do, what solutions does he provide for us? So, um, I'm seeing the answers there. Should, I know. Should we still answer? Yes, yes. What is it that you guys this, did? You was anybody writing notes? Yes. Were so you guys we, writing? we were saying, you know what group? Sorry, we said, you know what group that strikes? We would um the working class people could strike, go on strikes, okay. and um work stoppage. And we say not to do um join with any voting, do not vote, um stand up for for your rights, know your rights and stand up for it. Okay. And to um to cry out against dictatorship. So those were some of the things that we were discussing. He said that for the working for the working class, our power is in our ability to stop working. Because that's that's mainly the, the, the basic thing that we can do to stop working. Like what happened with um in the nineteen thirties with Jamaica under um Bustamante and, and Norman Manley. Yeah, they led yeah. the, the sugar workers under strikes and, and this caused unions to be formed and so on. So that's the voice of the people to stop working because they depend on us to work. Mm -hmm. They want us to work. So, what is going on in terms of unions in Jamaica now? Um, what is it? What um, how how influential and how organized and how active are unions in Jamaica? And what has been the policy of the Jamaican government in terms of ensuring to maintain that we have unions? And or has there been a move to to make unions dormant? No, sir. Do, um, unions are still strong, but not as strong in my view. I must say in yeah. my view that they are not as strong as they used to be in the early days. But unions, they, they are still strong. They still have a voice. They still help the people to, to, um, to understand their workers, their rights as workers. Um, the government doesn't have any much, what I should say, they don't tie the hands or, and, and feet of the, the unions. They allow them to, to do their work, except that most times, if there is a strike call, then the, the Minister of Labor would step in quickly. And it is, their policy that all unions must listen to the, 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 the Minister of Labor. So if the Minister of Labor says, call for a go back to work, then people go back to work. Nowadays, what I find is that unions more help like an individual. Mm -hmm. Yes, they do call, they do um, strike for pay still and so on, but most times it's for an individual, a person who feels that they have been unjustly treated by the workplace. Yes. That's the time when you realize how strong a union is. Okay. All right. That's um that's good. That's good. What about anybody else? Um, as you will, what about question that um in terms of Rodney highlights the historical examples of the sugar workers strike and bauxite demonstrating the potential of united labor actions challenge the dictatorship's authority and he emphasizes the need for workers not to fear strikes labeled as political there's one there in, in one instance say for example buster manti was you know he started the bitu but um do we still have the bitu the trade unions 
and they used to have trade unions in Jamaica and then PNP had their yes, own so trade unions and they used to be quite and it was very political so you know if BITU which is now JLP if they took control then BITU is is driven by some kind of the, the political policy of whichever party it's in power you know but anyway so the ultimate weapon against the dictatorship is the mass withdrawal of labor representing the power of the people. Well, let's look at question two. What is the significance of civil disobedience and non-cooperation in the struggle for liberation? Another group, answer that one. What is the significance of civil disobedience and non-cooperation in the struggle for liberation? Another group can answer that one. What is the significance of civil disobedience and, and non-cooperation in the struggle for liberation? And is that even possible within an environment that is highly politicized and religious? Any other group? Any group would like to tackle that? Uh, Jadeen, what group are you in? Sorry, you hearing me? I can hear you now, yes. Okay, I was saying based on the reading that um, I was doing and the discussion in our group, um, I'd mentioned that based on the reading, it seemed like the civil disobedient, uh, the movement really originated with the Indian, and their liberation from the British um, rule. And really it was um, an active, um, it's a disobedience or what do you call it? I'm looking forward against government policies, right? Yes. Say for uh, example, is, what a, um, say for example, the, Mm -hmm. Say, for example, what, what is some, when we talk about civil disobedience, what are some of the ways that we can practice civil disobedience? Or what are the ways that, if you read, read or what are some of the ways that they practice civil disobedience? In addition to not paying taxes, what else? Or to break specific regulation. So yes. taxes may be one, and mm -hmm. then... Um, well, we have, we have policies that man the law and the workforce. So I yes. guess if we were See, going to go against those, that would also... Say, for example, unions, yes, if they, if, they say, if they said that, okay, you can't strike or you must go back to work, those can, and you just defy mm -hmm. that. No, you don't go back to work and so on, and you still strike and organize. That's some kind of civil disobedience going against um, civil laws, some professional laws, okay? Um, and there's also, but I'm not cooperating and non-cooperation, the struggle for liberation. Those are some of the, anyway, so sorry for cutting you. So those are some of the ways that he's talking about. Now, I mean, how can you achieve that? Um, does, how is that possible with, within a highly political and religious society? How is that possible? Rodney draws inspiration from historical figures like Mahatma Gandhi and civil rights movement in the US, showing how civil disobedience and non-cooperation against oppressive laws and regimes can be effective tools for change. Um, he advocated for citizens to resist cooperating in their own oppression and to be guided by the higher law of justice rather than unjust laws. Okay, so um, he talks about the fact, so he explored in, when I sent you the article for you to read, but he talks about the fact that we should advocate for citizens to resist cooperating in our own oppression, our own oppression, and instead be guided by a law that is above us. So um, if you study the civil rights movement in America or Mahatma Gandhi and 
how they were able to organize against the oppressors, oppressors in, and that includes disobeying the status quo, disobeying official laws. Those are, and whatever the, the case might be, but of course there are those who say, give to Caesar what is due to Caesar. What does that mean? There are people who point to that, that we won't have time to get into that, but we are just introducing some of the concept. The third one was how can national unity be achieved in Guyana? given its diverse racial and class division. And that was historically speaking, because we don't have time, I'm just gonna push forward. Rodney points out that racial unity has been consolidated in the face of the crisis, racial, racial unity with Africans and Indians, you talk about Africans and Indians, um, with Africans and Indians standing together, standing together in their struggle for for bread and justice. He argues that broad unity across existing class lines is necessary and outlines the potential role of various groups such as local businessmen, professionals, and the middle class in a government of national unity. Such a government, he asserts, would represent a unified front against the dictatorship with each group's interests adequate adequately represented and respected. Of course, we still, I mean, we still have various groupings, but we find a way to come together and, okay, ensuring that each group's interest is represented. Finally, I mean, number four, what is the alternative to the Burham dictatorship at the time? And how can the people reclaim their rights and restore democracy? Answer, if you read his article or his essay, Rodney proposes a government of national unity, a socialist government, a nationalist, a kind of government, or say, for example, I've been contending for a Caribbean federation. Rodney proposes a government of national unity as the, as the alternative to the oppressive regime. He emphasizes that the working class must play a leading role in such a government but all sectors and interest group should be represented. All sectors and interest group should be represented, not just a few, not just the Catholics, not just the Anglicans, not just those who have a, 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 an overseas education, not only those who can speak English very well, not the colored, those who are the browning and so on and so forth, but everyone. The government of national unity offers a clear alternative to the dictatorship mobilizing the population and gaining support both locally and internationally. And finally, how can resistance be sustained against the violence and- Sorry, sorry hold on. Sorry, I can see what number four, the question four, please, before you move to five. I sent this, you You guys ha will have this okay. in your, e I've emailed okay. this to you guys. You guys have this document, okay, just so you know. Um, I just asked Chantel to send it to you, but question four, what is the alternative to dictatorship? Um, and I said that um, he proposed in, in the essay based on what he, he wrote, he proposes a government of national unity. Okay, instead of not just a PNP or GLP, or just, or a, a government or a, an ind independent, say for example, talking about independence, Jamaica, instead of having different states, he proposes like a federation, so to speak, but still with, Okay, but bearing in mind those unique interests that we have. Um, so the fifth question was, how can resistance be sustained against the violence and intimidation of the dictatorship? Rodney acknowledges the violent responses to the regime of resistance, but asserts, we call it the violent responses, we call that backlash, a backlash from the status quo. Okay, whenever, they, whenever the resistance starts to rise, there's a backlash. And the, and the backlash can be done whether through de jure factors or de facto factors. Okay, de jure factors or de facto factors. Factors that are either systematic or, or factors that stem from actual policies. Um, he draws on historical examples of, of undying courage and resistance from Guyana's history. He encourages the the cultivation of a spirit of resistance using language, song, 
and other artistic expressions as weapons to confront the dictatorship's oppression. So when you see Rasta, um, Babylon, this whole issue of the Babylon, talk about Babylon and you talk about the Rastas and, and the revivalist group and, and, what, and the songs and the religion, it was a religion of resistance with songs, with drummings and songs of resistance. So of course he incorporates this liberation ideology. Yes, he, he, he liberates, he incorporates this, this kind of the music and the rhythm and the dance and the cultures and how and, this, and, the, and so on. Artistic expressions, he's as weapon, Frank Fanon says the Negro is not full stop any more than the white man in terms of how we speak, moving away from the center and going and speaking from the periphery, okay? Drummings and, 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 and new music, Rast, reggae music, dance or music, the kumina, and so on and so forth. In summary, Rodney's essay explores essential questions related to working class, to the working class power national unity, and the path towards liberation in Guyana. But you can take that, he's talking about Guyana, but you can take it, but you can take what the experience of Guyana and the examples and his message, and you can put it, you can implant it into almost any Caribbean island, any island that's suffering or dealing with decolonization and, and, and the irony of that. Notice I said the irony of that. <laughs> His answers highlight, highlight the historical lessons of collective labor actions, civil disobedience, and the need for a government of national unity as a clear alternative to the oppressive dictatorship. He calls for a united and determined effort to reclaim democracy and build a just and equitable society for all Guyanese. And by extension, the Caribbean and vulnerable groups in the world. And that's where we end um, on the issue of, of um, that's where we will end on the issue of, of um, Walter Rodney. And I will go quickly into looking at project plan. No, Caribbean, is it this one? and attitudes, blah, 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 blah. Is it this one? Ah, this is this. And so we will end, so we are finished with, the, we only have about nine minutes. I'm gonna try and wrap up as quickly as possible. Um, I wanted to end with Caribbean theology, um, which is the final, and um, probably we probably take it up next week, but, there's an essay, there's a research that you guys are doing. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. Last week, a week before last, I did a lecture at Jamaica Theology, July 11th, which you guys can watch. It's available on YouTube. It's called Caribbean Theology. Should theology transcend culture? Should theology transcend culture? Is God universal? Should theology transcend culture? Is God universal? And I asked, I start by asking the question, if, if God is universal, if God is universal, and you know, we're talking about the issue of disobedience and non-cooperation, but we are told to be, to talk about this gentle Jesus, meek and mild, and the issue of being complicit simpletons based on a theology and a philosophy that we have inherited that make us willing participants in our own demise, in our own continued colonization. So then we go into our theology and I ask, if God is universal, can we contend for a theology of God that transcends culture? However, Kant, Immanuel Kant said that history is a result of the varieties of human natures and circumstances and throughout history. Man has imposed an idea of God that caters to his privileges, contexts, and goals. Goals. 
his goals. Muta Baruka, Muta Baruka of Jamaica said that God is a human creation, meaning that the way we understand God is the way humans have determined that we see God. Again, Muta Baruka said that God is a human creation, meaning that the way we understand God is the way humans have determined that we see God, stroking human egos. Yet, Paul Tillich, Paul Tillich declared that God is man's ultimate concern. That's, what, that's his word, not mine. Paul Tillich said that God is what? Man's ultimate concern and possesses that internal drive which predisposes him to a Sorry, guys, I got disconnected. Thank God you guys are still here. <laughs> Sorry about that. My phone, my, my laptop died. I had um, disconnected my laptop accidentally from the power. But let's, let's, um, let us continue. From, um, uh, let us continue. Um, let us continue. I said that, um, where are we? Sorry about that, guys. I completely, I, I, I apologize about that. But let us continue. I will share my screen. Let me share my screen. Where am I? Here we go. This is very important. This is, we're wrapping up the lecture. I'll go as quickly as possible because I want to quickly talk about um, the, 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 the thing that we're doing, the project. Um, I said, Paul Tillett declared that God is man's ultimate concern and possesses that internal drive, that man, which predisposes him to a reality of God that is deep, which has always escaped him, so that we live our lives pursuing the existence of God through worship, faith, or some transcendental experience. Now, just as human drives lead him or her to contend with the truth to contend with the truth of his own existence. Again, just as human drives, human drives, our id, our ego, and the superego, just as human drives lead him to contend with the truth of our own existence or the truth of his own existence within multiple realities of time and space, which extends beyond the world, he or she, we, find him or herself, ourselves, in the outer space. In the outer space. Uh, let me say that again. Paul Tilly declares, or declared, that God is what? Man's ultimate concern and possesses that internal drive which predisposes him to a reality of God that is deep. Which has always escaped him. This reality of God. So that we live our lives pursuing the existence of God, pursuing it, 
because you know remember we said that god is what man's ultimate concern so we live our lives pursuing what the existence of god through what through worship faith or some transcendental experience, transcendental, that is beyond us, transcendental, as against imminence. Just as human drives lead him or her to contend with the truth of his own existence within multiple realities of time and space, which extends beyond the world, he or she finds him or herself in the outer space the outer space. Human beings are always working to discover something, you know? Human beings, we are always working to discover something beyond ourselves, either within or without. And find themselves or ourselves traveling as far as to the moon in hopes of finding what? Truth that extends from the limitations of life on earth or within his personal domains. He goes beyond his personal domains. Yet Descartes philosophizes. Descartes philosophizes. Philosophizes that what? Philosophizes mean he reasons. He, 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 re, he uses reason through logic. Descartes philosophizes that what we know for certain is not beyond the subjective. We talked about Descartes, cogito e gusum, I think, therefore I am. It's 9.59, guys. Don't leave. Nobody leaves. Please, just give me 10 minutes to wrap up. Nevertheless, man has imposed a reality of God that is universal and objective in the hopes of advancing a life that places, that places him or her above the rest. We say that life is about people and how they relate. Yet life is what people make of it and human tendencies to promote self has created dynamics couched in the universal creation of a God that exceptionalizes his personal experiences and cultures and go as far as to discredit other ideas and perspectives of God that competes with his position and place in life. This has led to the, to the conquests and crusades and the destruction of cultures where some with a westernized theology of God created a new world in the eyes of their own perspective. The Europeans went to Africa and the Caribbean to spread religion in the name of a God, to spread religion, a particular way of life and to take away the prospects of others, which they justify in that same way. Faith in that same way. Discrediting those who have found God for themselves. Walter Rodney wrote how Europe underdeveloped Africa, yet Europeans justify their efforts based in a theology that is exceptional and one that promotes their cultures and ways over others. Was it not Balfour in Cromer that said in, English, in the English parliament in the, in the 1600s that England knows what is best for Egypt and that if anything good came out of Egypt is a result of the English who brought religion to Africa as if what the Egyptians and Africans had were primitive or devilish. So we speed forward to today and question how our theology, how our theology comes from a legacy that creates a way of life that limits any plausible resistance to domination and control for such was the strategy that led to the takeover that was deep using a religion from a particular space that creates obeyance to a law, obedience to a law, steeped in a conspiracy that ensures willing companions who are easily controlled. But Caribbean theology, Caribbean theology, critically re-examines the history of a theology that is devoid of our legacies outside of European experiences. 
in today's discussion in Caribbean theology, the students using Caribbean theologians, such as Lewin Williams and Garnet Roper and others, critically examined the top-down theology that has created these dynamics in life that has led to the position of man in a global, in the global south as against the global north and races. As we begin, one student began to share about his practice of theology as a Jamaican police educator who teaches at the police academy on ethics. We ask, is there an ethics that is based in a religion from below or above? Further, 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 he shares, he shares his challenges in developing his theology within the cultural realities and experiences of Caribbean. We consider how Caribbean peoples themselves find suspicious any indigenous theology, any indigenous theology stemming from their own African legacies, which is largely seen as fringe, but promote the colonizer's faith as normative. Again, we consider how Caribbean peoples themselves find suspicious any indigenous theology stemming from their own African legacies, which is largely seen as fringe, but promote the colonizer's faith as normative. Another student discusses how he struggles with his own theology outside of a biblical understanding that we have accepted as ideal due to either a brainwashing or the exclusivity of scriptures, which continues to promote one reality over another, where man continues to stroke his egos over others. And I will leave you to, now this is available, um, this particular is available. You can watch Caribbean theology. Should theology be, um, uh, should, should, um, should theology sh transcend culture? Is God universal? Which now brings us to the study that we are doing. The study that we are doing, a research proposal based on all that we have said, exploring changing attitudes towards Afro-Caribbean beliefs in Jamaica. We are, we are part of this lab. You guys are part of this lab based on our study, based on our findings, based on our reflection, our critical reflection. The research is we are exploring changing attitudes towards changing attitudes towards Afri Afro-Caribbean belief in Jamaica. The thing is, being in this class, what was your attitude before? Okay, what is your attitude now? How has it changed? What has created the change? Okay. How will you adjust and adapt your reflections? Okay. This is part of what we're doing in Caribbean theology and this invention and charting this new chart in the 21st century. So we want to explore changing attitudes towards Afro-Caribbean beliefs in Jamaica. Um, and so I, I'm gonna send this to you guys. I don't know, if, no, have you guys gotten this? I published this in a nice um, 15 page paper, which with table of content, you have the introduction, the research objectives of a methodology. When you do a research, this is how you do it. When you're doing, even, whether it's a small research or a larger research, you know, you have a proposal, you have, a, you have your title, Exploring Changing Attitudes Towards Afro-Caribbean Beliefs in Jamaica, a study of social, political, religious, and cultural influences. Then you go to, you have your introduction, your research objectives, what's your methodology, um, um, and so on, uh, ethical considerations, our conclusions, research questionnaire, study notes. Um, now, so let us, I'm going to wrap this up in five minutes or so. I'm going to try my best. Now, the introduction is that in Jamaica, there has historically been a negative perception towards African and indigenous spiritual practices, religious beliefs, customs, and faiths that draw influences from urban Indian heritage or African traditions. You notice how I brought to bear all that we have done in this, in this? very important. Again, in Jamaica, there has historically been a negative perception towards African and indigenous spiritual practices, religious beliefs, customs, and faiths that draw influences from urban Indian heritage or African traditions, Rastafarianism, such as Rastafarianism, Obia, Voodoo, Pokomania, Poco Church, 
revivalists and Muslim beliefs have often been marginalized, deemed as fringe, demonic, unpopular, juxtaposed against the inherited traditions from European colonialism. The Judeo-Christian faith, such as Roman Catholicism, Protestantism and evangelic evangelicalism has been favored and considered closer to the truth and the ideal. However, in the 21st century, with increased exposure, awareness, critical thinking, and a more liberal lifestyle, particularly among the younger generation, it is crucial to investigate whether attitudes towards Afro-Caribbean beliefs are changing in Jamaica and the Caribbean and Caribbean community. This study aims to explore the shifting attitudes of Jamaicans and the Caribbean and the factors contributing to these changes, considering demographic variables such as location, age, group, educational levels, income status, political affiliation, denominationality, and religious beliefs. Our research objectives include to examine a to examine if Jamaican attitudes towards Afro-Caribbean beliefs have evolved over time. B, to determine if specific demographic factors influence changing attitudes, including location, age group, educational levels, income status, political affiliation, denominationality, and religious beliefs. C, to investigate the potential role of sociopolitical factors religious influences, education, pop culture, travel experiences, and exposure in shaping attitudes towards Afro-Caribbean beliefs. And D, to explore perceptions of African religious practices as cultic or occult and their, impact, and their impact on attitudes. Here, for example, Jehovah's Witness is considered to be in a cult of Christianity. You know that? What do I mean? Um, Church of Latter-day Saints is said to be a cult of Christianity. Even some in Jamaica go as evangelical Christians go as far as to say that Roman Catholics is a cult of Christianity because they believe in the apocryphal scriptures and that you can pray for the dead who go to purgatory for holding. You can do that. You, when you study church history, you guys are well aware of that. Our methodology involves a participant selection a diverse sample of Jamaican individuals representing different demographics, including location, urban to rural or to city, age group 13 to 25, 25 to 34, 35 to 44, 45 to 54, 55 to 64, 65 and above, educational levels, income status, political affiliation, PNP or GLP, denominationality or religiosity, Protestant, Anglican, Roman Catholic, so on and so forth. Islam. Now, the second, uh, number two, as it relates to methodology, questionnaire development, a research question will be re redesigned, which we have here, which you guys will get to do yourselves and will also get to distribute to some of your friends, families, people in the community, people at your church, okay? Um, you guys can even do, yeah, we all, this is really good for us. Um, as I said to you, we have to write our own history, do it ourselves. A research questionnaire will be designed to collect both quantitative and qualitative data qualitative and quantitative data. The questionnaire will cover the following sections. One, demographics. In other words, we wanna gather the, the, the gender, the age, the location, educational level, income status, and so on. B, religious affiliation. C, section C will have attitudes towards Afro-Caribbean beliefs. We will measure participants in level of agreement with statements reflecting attitudes towards Afro-Caribbean beliefs. Four, additional information, provide participants an opportunity to share their personal experiences, perceptions, and factors influencing their attitudes towards Afro-Caribbean beliefs. And five, optional information, explore participants' political affiliation and any additional thoughts they may have. C, in terms of methodology, data collection, the questionnaire will be distributed through online platforms, social media, and local community centers, to ensure a wide representation of Jamaican society. The responses will be collected anonymously to maintain confidentiality. So you guys can share it to your on social media. You will all get a copy of the, so you, will, you will get this, this major, the methodology and the proposal, but this is not what you will send to people. You will set, distribute the actual questionnaire, okay? Which there's something that's called the official questionnaire that I just updated, the official questionnaire. 
that's what you will send. But as it relates to the proposal and the methodology, and this is for us. Now, if someone says, hey, you want, if people want more information, you can send them this document or you guys can have the discussions because you have this. But okay, but when you are going to actually do the data collection, you want to, you can send emails to people, you can give it to people at church, you can do online and so on and so forth. I actually have a, I have this on, um, I am going to, I've already started to share this online and I've also submitted a copy to the Jamaica Gleaner and I will, and some of you can send it to the observer. I give you all full right, send it to the observer, send the actual, the, send it to the observer, send it to the star, talk about it with your friends at church, develop workshops among your churches. I know we don't have much time for it, but um, you, this course ends soon. So when the course ends, my goal is that for, we want to, we're gonna do a, we're gonna do two findings, an initial finding from what we do here, and then, but we want to continue. We're going to work it into a, a major finding, and then that's what we're going to produce the Caribbean Thought Journal, which is the final. Your this our our work here and some of your essays and discussions that you've done will be part of that thought journal, um, and so on. But this is how we. But I hope that you will be you will you will continue to be part of this particular study, part of this. And you can create, formulate other interests of your own. How is Caribbean? How are our attitudes and our beliefs and practices changing? You can do it for anything, okay? For anything, you guys can read this. You can look at it and redistribute it into something else. You might be, you might want to find out some some ideas about something else, okay? But the data, but data analysis will be done by analyze. We will ana we will analyze the data. The questionnaire data will be analyzed using statistical methods, including descriptive analysis and inferential statistics. Qualitative data will undergo thematic analysis to um to identify recurring patterns, themes, and insights, which I will do. That's going to take the most of the work will be done by data analysis, which I will spend a lot of time to do. Some of you want to help me with that after the course is ended, that would be great. But for now, you'll be graded based on just the initial filling out the questionnaire and submitting it to one or two students. Um, ethical considerations, as I wrap up this, this study, will adhere to ethical guidelines, ensuring participant and non anonymity, anonymity, informed consent, and voluntary participation. The collected data will be securely stored and um, used solely for research purposes. When you collect the questionnaires, send, them back, send it back. Some people you may, you may want to call them to do it. You may even inv invite your pastor to do this or your, and so on. But this is, this is quite powerful and interesting for, you, for us to be part of this. Now, our con the conclusion, by examining changing attitudes towards Afro-Caribbean beliefs in Jamaica, this study aims to shed light on the impact of socio-political factors, the impact of religion, the impact of education, the impact of pop culture, the impact of travel experience, the impact and exposure to the evolving perceptions of Jamaicans, and colonization. The findings will contribute to a deeper understanding of how societal changes influ influence cultural attitudes, promoting inclusivity, tolerance, cultural heritage preservation. Ultimately, this research aims to encourage a more informed and respectful dialogue surrounding Afro-Caribbean beliefs in Jamaican society and by extension, the Caribbean. And, the, and this is the questionnaire, and it's all there. It's attached to the, to the main work. I won't go through it because you guys have the questionnaire there. And notice there's a part that's a section four. In your own words, describe your understanding of perception. Okay, that's, that's quite powerful. Uh, have you personally experienced any changes in your attitudes? Are there any? Now, this document, I don't want you guys to do. This is just the, um, this document is the essay. Um, they met the, mem the this is like to the proposal for you guys to keep as part you guys are part of the research you guys are researchers that's for you guys if people you know to be familiar people might want to have questions and so on you guys keep that what you guys distribute is the bottom is the questionnaire okay and we have a different i i'm gonna i send you two documents i send you this main document which is the proposal and in, okay, and then I send you the official, the actual questionnaire with you. The questionnaire will only start from here. When you give to people, you just give them this. So 
Okay, so when I when we when myself um, and sorry, sir, sorry to interrupt yeah. you. If you are showing us something, I am seeing your YouTube screen. I'm not sure what anybody else is seeing. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Okay, let me um stop share. And let me start share again. I'm sorry. I was sharing uh from another uh, well you you uh, you know you are right on it. You're right on the top of things. I like that. I like when you are right on top of things, man. You're right on top of things. Um, I didn't expect, you know, I was reading from a document. This is what I was reading from, actually. I was reading from this. <laughs> you noticed, you, did you guys get a copy of this? Did you guys see this? Um, I know that we got a number of documents. I'm not sure if this is one of them. Um, I haven't had a chance to look at them in detail. So this is a 15-page paper. It is the it is the research proposal for you to review. That's the arguments, the methodology. It has a table of uh, it has a cover page, table of content. Um, then it looks at the introduction, research objectives, methodology. I was reading from this just now ethical consideration this is your paper you don't send this out to people this is for you guys part of the study now if people want more information about the study then you could send them this but this is for you guys to keep you guys are part of the research study you guys are the principal part of their principles myself and you guys we are we own the study so you don't give this to people what you give to people is the actual questionnaire which is the is I will send you guys a document. It's called the official questionnaire, and it will only start from this Jamaica Theological Seminary, Caribbean Thought and Theology Research Questionnaire, Exploring Change in Attitude. So this is all that people, those who are going to participate, that's what they get. Um, and you will, I will, but I also attach two documents: this one, the official questionnaire, and the research, the proposal, okay, which summarizes everything and so on and so forth. Okay, so so this is what you guys will get to give to to this. Um, or you will get an email called official questionnaire. You do it. You do one, and then you you send out five to anybody randomly. Your church, your school. You can call on the phone and go over it, or you could send it to them via social media, and you get it back over the next two, three, four, five days. Hopefully, we get it back as quickly as possible. And then, okay, and then there are notes at the bottom. The study notes. Study notes on Caribbean Afro religious and religions and practices. I have some study notes which it says Jamaican religious traditions have a rich and diverse history, particularly within Afro Caribbean communities. And by that, Afro Caribbean communities, not just in Jamaica, but all over the Caribbean, Africa, the US, and the world, even in Europe, Jamaica, Jamaica, Jamaican, we, we, Jamaica have started, Jamaican started some religions that's right now in the world, with the revivalist religion in fact that's uh, we have churches in jamaica in the u.s from that and we talk about the rastafari movement that started by jamaicans many of them are in in ghana and even in the u.s when my nephew went to ghana just came back yesterday and he was talking about what they're doing it's quite quite interesting um what's going on in ghana i should have had him come to class and talk about the Ghana experience. Quite a few Jamaicans live in Ghana, quite a few live in Ethiopia, Eritrea, so on and so forth. This stemming from this back to Africa, African movement and so on. A lot of Jamaicans have businesses in Ghana and so on and so forth. Um, so um, some of them, I mean, in terms of technology, they're not as advanced technologically in terms of Wi-Fi, but some in so, depending on where you go. But Jamaican religious traditions have a rich and diverse history, particularly within Afro. Caribbean communities, when over 750,000 African captives were brought to Jamaica from religions such as, from sorry, from regions such as the Bight of Biafra, which is now called Ghana. A lot of Jamaicans, a lot of Jamaicans came from, a lot of the slaves from Jamaica, who are living in Jamaica, they came from Ghana, and many of them came from West Africa during the late 18th century. And by that, I mean the 1700s, or from the 1600s up to um, a variety of African and a variety of African and African influenced religious practice began to emerge as a result of the Jamaicans coming to the Caribbean, sorry, coming to the Ghana, sorry, the, 
the Africans from Ghana and so on coming, say, for example, uh, also Zemi Gambia. Um, but Dottie Bookman came to Jamaica in the 1700s and then he escaped from Jamaica, started Obia, left from Jamaica and went to, 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 to Haiti and, and continued and, and developed the voodoo. In fact, many Jamaicans, um, and, and he knew how to speak Quran. And in a sense, he could speak the Quran and many of them had this Muslim, but you don't hear about that. Many were, could, they were versed, many of the Africans who came to Jamaica, and so many of them were versed in the, in the Quran. They could read the Quran. Many of them were Muslim, but you never heard that. No, you're learning that, oh, Muslims are just coming into Jamaica now. You know, trying, you know what's going on. But no, it was always the case. They were here before. One of the prominent traditions is Obia. Obia, which serves as a system of herbal, and this is important, Obia serves as what? A system of herbal and spiritual technology used for various purposes. Obia practitioners, often referred to as readers, go to the reader man, the reader man. Many of them are referred to as what? Readers. They are skilled herbalists. They are skilled herbalists who are sought after for healing, for healing physical, spiritual, and mental disorders as well as protection from malevolent spirit, um, spiritual forces. Malevolent means bad, bad um, devilish forces. So Obia was, I'm sorry, I'm wrapping up now. I'm so sorry, guys. Please just bear with me as I wrap up this last section. I'm so sorry for going over. Just, and this is the last part. We just have four, listen, it's, oh, we're almost finished with it. I'm, I'm, let me just quickly go through and then we're done. I'm sorry for keeping you. Just let me just wrap this up. This is very important. This is very, very important. Very, and my, when I did the research, I do, I did the research, some of what I'm, the research, I did it for Caribbean theology and, I, and also for the course, and I found it quite interesting. I want you to understand this. This is very important what I'm reading. Obia, where am I? I said, okay, so I said one of the prominent traditions is Obia, which serves as a system of herbal, and spiritual technology used for various purposes. Obia practitioners often referred to as what readers. They were skilled in. They were skilled herbalists. They were sought after for healing physical, spiritual, and mental disorders, as well as protection from bad spirits. Obia was also historically associated with what? With slave, with slave resistance and revolt. Again, Obia was was historically associated with what? With what? With slave resistance and revolt. With beliefs in its practitioners' ability to poison and dominate others through the manipulation of shadows. Some researchers trace the origins of Obia to the Ashanti, the Ashanti, the Ashanti, the Ashanti people of present day Ghana, present day Ghana, and their practice of what? Of Obia Yifo, same thing as Obia, Obia Yifo. This is very important. So Obia was re associated with slave resistance. That is one of the reasons why it was discredited because African religion was also involved African resistance. So the Europeans and this Eurocentric ideology of God discredited the African religion because African religion was also used as a form of resistance. So that resistance, so of course, Obia is against the ulterior motive of this European domination and colonization. And as well. Now, another significant that yeah, voodoo with Haitian voodoo, and just so you, and yes, Haitian voodoo revival. 
Jamaican revivalism has numerous churches and congregations, U.S. cities. The U.S. To talk about, okay, Jamaican today. It, it incorporates elements. West African Asian religion. While the Holy Spirit is said to possess devotees in revivalist traditions, Spirits of biblical figures like Jeremiah and Peter are also invoked. By the way, um, the, in Brayton, in Brayton, there were, uh, I used to go look for one of my friends, M Michael. Um, we went to church together and when I was a little boy and we, I, we were always afraid to walk. I would have to walk up the street to get to his house on the left. And there was a revivalist, a, a group that followed the revivalist faith. And we were always told to walk far, or we were nervous of the revival, or you see certain houses, you walk far, you know, stop, it will catch you, and you know, you walk far. So when I said that this it was it from a child growing up, we always looked down on certain African traditions and so on, and that's with a certain way and a certain fear. Perhaps the most well-known Jamaican religious traditions is Rastafarianism, which emerged during the, the depression. Did somebody talk about the 1930s and so on with Bustamante? It's not just the BITU or the Industrial Trade Union or whatever. There was also the Rastafarianism, which emerged during the Depression years of the 1930s. It is a complex spiritual political movement. It is a complex spiritual political movement that combines Jamaican folk Christianity with pan African, Africanist sentiments influenced by Marcus Garvey's U, United Negro Improvement Association, the UNIA. Rastafarians reject British colonial. And just so you know, remember Marcus Garvey, though, although it's, they, it, they borrow some of Marcus Garvey's stuff, Marcus Garvey will tell you he was pro Christian, not Rasta. While George Padmore, his, he was more of a different kind of a, he couldn't, he couldn't see a Christianity of liberation theology or, or uh, that, that influences liberation, but or nationalism. Moving right along, they, uh, Rastafarianism believe Haile Selassie, the 20th century emperor of Ethiopia, known as the Lion of Judah, to be the 20, 225th king of biblical Ethiopia. Rastafarians adopted the name Ras or Rastafari, which means Prince of Tafari province as their own some Rastafarians have even settled in Ethiopia, Ghana, and Zaire, fulfilling the dream of a return to Africa. Remember Africa to Africans and so on? Rastafarians interpret the Old Testament as the history of Black people. The Old Testament as the history. This is how they interpret it. Now they talk about interpretation, how you interpret the scriptures. Rastafarians interpret the Old, te Old Testament as the history of black people and view themselves as successors to biblical prophets, successors to biblical prophets. They often speak as the present day voices of prophets like Moses and Joshua and Isaiah. Now the distinctive Rastafarian hairstyle, dreadlocks, symbolizes both the lion's mane and the strength of the biblical figure, Samson. Rastafarians believe that African warriors also wore their hair in a similar style. The sacramental use of marijuana among Rastafarians is considered to bring divine inspiration to cure diseases and enhance strength. And just so you know, for years, many people looked down on Rastas, especially with this marijuana, this marijuana, while countries of the global north, um, they always said that um, marijuana had certain physical and mental uses and people and 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 the status quo the dominant class the system would fight them down for that 
look down. And now what is happening in the US and all over the world, I'm not sure in terms of Jamaica, but in all over the world, they are developing the, um, marijuana in, um, in such a way um, that, that the Rastas had all So you are muted. There are a lot of attack, just so you guys know. And I want you to constantly pray for me. And I want you guys to pray, even in your church. What kind of you saw this thing about Walter Rodney. Yes? Walter Rodney and what he's doing. I'm going at my research as a post-colonial subject and critical history, revisiting history and looking at the history of society that is not what people want people to you know they ban black books and they're banning critical race theory books and so on my books is one of those books that they're going to be banning okay and so challenging the status quo is never easy so i want you to to pray for me daily to, that god will give me strength and empower me people try to go on my ip address block my ip address um right now I, I they have prevented me from logging into my secure wi-fi i've been using my open wi-fi but suddenly i lost connections to my wi-fi um twice and i have very good and strong wi-fi service and i and but over the last couple of weeks i have not been able to use my wi-fi my secure wi-fi i have to use an open wi-fi as if i am borrowing wi-fi from the public but i have a wi-fi that i pay for but I have been blocked and only I can only use the Wi-Fi that is unsecure where people can go onto my network and do and see everything I'm seeing and so on. And I've been trying to fix it. And no matter how I log into my own secure, I cannot get into it. But just now I will, they log me off twice. And suddenly today I am back on the Wi-Fi and um, it, I'm telling you, it is ridiculous. <laughs> but I said, there is no challenge that I have not learned to overcome. There is no obstacle that I will not overcome. There is none. Okay, because Amen, greater sir. is he that is me than he that is in the world. But let me wrap up, wrap up. I was at my last point. I was making a profound point here. And then I wrap up. The last point I was making as it relates to the project. Ooh, where are we? Mm -mm. Sorry, that's not where I'm at. The last point, I was at the last point before my system got corrupted just now um my system was just corrupted and it keeps crashing the point i was i don't know what point i was making but we'll move on we'll end here 
In the United States, Rastafarianism is widely associated with its reggae music, which carries the rhythm and message of the tradition. Reggae lyrics often expresses social protests and the longing to return to the biblical Ethiopia. Rastafarianism through its cultural expressions and resistance to Eurocentric Jamaican and American cultures affirms African identity and serves as a form of protest even to today. Again, Rastafarianism through its cultural expression and resistance to Eurocentric Jamaican and American cultures affirms African identity and serves as a form of protest even to today. And that is the end. I apologize for the, for the just now that we, we had a break, but, um, but we are back. That's it, guys. Powerful class. I appreciate um, that you got those who stayed until 1039. This, this recording will be available. Hopefully, I'm going to, all the videos that you haven't watched, I'm going to, I have two more from last week to publish. And then this one. So I have one, two, three videos that you haven't seen yet. So I will publish them. You get them between, I'm still doing them between today and tomorrow. Okay. Um, if you have any questions or comments, you can send them in the email as it relates to the group. Um, we will resend the, the proposal again, Chantel. We will, we will send, resend them the proposal and the official question. Did I resend it to you last night? You guys might have gotten it. I think it was sent in the group, sir. I sent it in the group, the official, the updated ones, yes? Yes, so please. Yes, um, okay, so get those done. Remember, it's two. One is for you, for yourself to keep, to review for your own files, to review and so on as, as part of the study. And then as study principles, the other one is the, it's just a questionnaire to just give out to different people to participate. If people have any questions and to, for you to familiarize yourself also, that's why you have the paperwork and then um, send, do one for yourself as well. And then I, and then randomly give it to different people with different age group, starting from age 16, I think we start and above. Um, all right, guys. I just want to say thank sorry, you. Just this. before. Yeah, sorry, Justin. Welcome. How are you? Um, sir, just before you go, um, just a quick question. As it relates mm -hmm. to the question here, sir. Yeah. Um, I don't think I would be able to like have it print and issue. Um, a lot of person I spoke with, especially in my community, they were ready yeah. to do it like. I don't know what I'm calling. I don't know if I'm calling Google. The thing we do is when um on the website and just send it in, submit it. But the same. Google, Google. Yeah. It's a Microsoft was... document and it can be sent to, um, to WhatsApp and be, and be done on the phone as well. Uh, you can give it out through. You said you can. They can do it. They can. Um, you guys can complete. You can. Yeah, you can upload it via Google open it in google and complete it and then send it back like that or you could um op if you have google docs or docusign you know docusign like you docusign a document you open up this if you open it up you can open up in docusign there's a doc docusign you can open it in oh, docusign and docusign allows you to use check you could use your check buttons and so on and so forth but you can open it up in okay so i think i sent it to you in word so open it up in Word, and then you can complete it like that in Word, okay? Or you can Sorry. open it up. Yeah, go ahead. I sent it to someone, and they can't even add nothing to it. They can't answer the question. Uh, and they can't. Okay, Don't fine. Give them the option, yeah. Okay, do you say, how did they send it to them? Via Word or via PDF? Both, sir. Uh, wait, once they open it in Word, they, it, they can do it. Once it's open in Word, if you send it to them by a, as a Word document, then they can. Um, Her, it depends. It depends. Uh -huh. if the person is using their phone and they don't yes. have stuff office on their phone. Even if they open it up, they can't edit it. You have to have Microsoft on your phone. I uh -huh. suspect that most person, person might be using their phones. So it okay. may be able to open. There are some apps on the phone that can actually open Microsoft Word documents, but they can't edit it. You have to have Microsoft Office on your phone. Okay, okay, I see what you mean. So, 
Uh, I guess you have to. Okay, fine. So I'll have to find a way to to do so that. So I was suggesting that I asked in the class in the WhatsApp group whether we are going to do it in Google Forms because Google Forms you should be able to just send it to the person via email or WhatsApp, whatever. And they are once it's an Android phone or they have a laptop, they can do the Google. They can do it via Google Docs. The only thing, okay, great. But does Google Docs allow for multiple documents? Because what if you open it up in Google? Um, if you prepare the Google documents and send it, once we send it to anybody, you have access to it. Once yes, they do but, it, you have access to it. Yeah, but you see, it won't give me multiple forms. If somebody put, if one person complete the form, um, how will the other person and somebody else get the same form? We're going to see their responses or we or they'll be it's it's going to be difficult because google form only allow for one document unless you do it as a google it's not um there is a there is a is it google forms i don't i think it's google forms you can actually do a, a, a quiz but it's called a quiz or something like that in google forms where persons actually fill in the answers and it comes back to you uh, all the answers the answers come back to you the responses so if it's 10 responses you see the 10 responses as yes or no or whatever there is a way uh, to do it okay we will do it like that but and what i and would there's do another, there's another one called survey among i think there, there that's a, that's available you could even try that okay dante dane and Sh and Sh chantel you guys are responsible for that okay take let me know so how I to can, do that can anything more i'm stopped that <laughs> deadlines to meet all right, fine. Chantel, I need your help to do this, but you guys can yes, open sir. it. I, I can send it in Google Docs. Sorry, I can send it as a Google document in or as a DocuSign document. You can open it in no, Docs. No, like a Google, a Google document because none other person have DocuSign. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, but can All right. A Google account. All right, so I send it to you guys in Google Docs. And then... um. And then we'll let's work on that together, Chantel. Okay. Okay. No problem. All right. Thank you guys for 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 the, for staying on, and I really appreciate it. I thought I wasn't going to be teaching today because I have a major death in my family. My um, a cousin, um, well, sorry, my niece-in-law drowned, and uh, on Friday going into Saturday. And um, we, I got the news this afternoon, and they are in the middle of dealing with that right now. So I, um, but I was not going to teach, but I mustered up enough energy to teach. Um, that is what is happening. Okay, so please pray for us. I'm, um, I will talk with you guys some more. So if you, if you guys can open it up in Google Documents and complete for yourself. Sorry, yeah. let me correct okay. myself. It's not Google Docs here, it's Google Forms. Google, Google Forms. Right, sorry, I keep saying Docs, not Docs, it's Forms. Because Google Docs is like Microsoft Word, that's the counterpart to Microsoft Word, but it's Google Google Forms. Check it out. Okay, you you all have Google, um, okay, fine. You guys, I gave you guys a document, you guys can save it as well. Chantel, you guys can you can convert it into form and send it back to me and send it out to the students. Can you do that? Okay, so no problem. Right, the official one, the updated one that I sent you, not yes. the, the, the know, not sir. the only the questionnaire, not the proposal. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Not the proposal, the official questionnaire that I sent, the updated one that I just sent out. Do let's save that in Google form and then we and send it out to the students. Okay. Okay, sir. All right, see you guys on Wednesday. What good? All right, bye, sir. Yeah, man, we're talking a few.